Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I want to thank you today for the grace and the privilege. We appreciate you daily for everything that you are doing in our life. Accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. We have come together today, trusting that you have something to share with us. Lord, I'm asking that you speak directly to our hearts, into our lives, in the name of Jesus. Thank you because I know you've answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I want to welcome every one of you once again to the teaching of today. We'll be coming with the subject, the pastor and divorce. And I remember, I've already said, we are going to look at it again. And I want to appreciate every one of you all over the world for connecting together with us. Let's go straight to the teaching of tonight. The pastor and divorce. I discovered that it has become an epidemic in our society that ministers of God find it easy to change their wives. While their wife is still alive, while they are both living together, they found one fault in that woman and see her not to be compatible together with them and decide to quit her from their ministry. I'm afraid if this continue, what would have happened to the ordinary member of the church? If we, the ministers of the gospel, the preachers of the word of God, if we are not afraid to send our wives away, what will happen to the church in general? Which means, once that is easy for us, we are teaching our members that they can equally do the same without any problem. And this will bring more corruption more pollution and uh, draw back to our ministry and the church. I, let's take, go back to where we used to have our Bible reading. In Mark chapter 10, we start reading from verse 2. And the Pharisee came to him and asked him, Is it lawful? Is it proper? Is it right for a man to put away his wife tempting him? The Bible says these Pharisees came to Jesus with a question. And the question they have in mind was not a question that they were asking to know more. It wasn't a question that they were asking that will help them grow spiritually. It wasn't a question that they were asking to help them teach other people. It was a question that they were asking to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible makes us understand that these uh, people coming with a spirit and with a mind, not of knowing, but of tempting. In verse 3, and he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? For example, when he talks about Moses, he is referring them to the beginning. And in verse 4, and he said, Moses suffered. Moses permitted us to write a bill of divorcement and put her away. In verse 5, and Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. What is the meaning of that? Because of your stubbornness, because of your willful disobedience, because of your deliberate action, not willing to remain, not willing to walk, not willing to go, not willing to obey the word of God. That was why Moses gave you that precept. In verse 6, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Come back. You remember in Genesis chapter 2, where God created everything. Now the Bible says it was only Adam that never had a companion. And when you come to Genesis chapter 2 And you begin to look at it from verse 21 And the Lord caused a deep sleep To fall upon Adam And he slept And he took one of his ribs And closed up the flesh instead thereof And the rib which the Lord God Had taken from man He made a woman And brought her Unto the, womb, unto the man And Adam said This is now not in the past not in the future this is now this is now um, um, bone of my bone 
my flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and leave his mother. The Bible did not say the man shall abandon his father, forsake his father, run away from his father, for uh, uh, ignore his father, and disown his father. The Bible never say that. He said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. If you follow exactly what God began to tell us from this scripture, you will understand something very real. The Bible says, for this cause, shall a man leave his father. He didn't say, shall a woman leave his father and mother. Why? Because the moment the man goes to the parents of the woman and they paid the dowry, and then the parents have agreed that for the marriage that the two of them can go together. If they are Christian, they will come to the church. Right in the church, they do what we call uh, uh, solemnization. The pastor and the congregation will bring these people together and join them together with the Bible. And once that is done, the Bible now says they are no longer two, they become one. The woman has left his father and has left the mother from the church, the woman will follow the husband home. I know there are traditions where after the journey in the church, they will still say that the woman has to follow the parents back home so that uh, in the night they will not bring that woman to the husband. That is a wrong tradition. I know you will tell me <coughs> that is how we've been doing it. But who senior? Is it God or the parents? The parents are praying for their child. They've done that in their own house. The parents have released the, the woman. When they came to the church, you remember? As they came together, the pastor asked, who gave this woman to be married to this man? The father came. What did he do? He all oh, he took the right hand of the lady, hand that lady over to the pastor. What is he saying? I've handed my daughter over to God. Let God give my daughter to whoever he pleases. And the pastor will now ask the man, bring your hand. And the man will bring the hand. And the woman that the pastor has taken from the parents, he will now hand over that woman to the man. And the pastor now will pronounce the blessing. And after that, he will now say, those who God has joined together, let no man put asunder. You are praying for them. The pastor has finalized the whole thing because God supersedes everyone. Therefore, taking the woman back to the father's house or to the mother's house, that they will later bring her in the night. No, 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 no. They are breaking the protocol. The thing that God has ordained, that God has perfected, that God has completed, you are bringing in another thing. And in the night, they will now begin to say they are escorting the woman to the husband. And they will tell the man not to be in the house, that the man should disappear. It is only when the woman comes that the man will now finally come. You are wrong. The two of them should move from the church either to the reception place and as soon as the reception is over the two of them go to their house whatever happened does not concern you anymore and now now the woman has left the father and has left the mother and the two of them have become one and they are already living together the bible never again begin to tell us the woman shall leave the father and the mother it is now completely the affair of the man and the wife but when we take it otherwise we turn it in another way, that um, the man has not left the father, he has not left the mother, or the woman has not left the father and left the mother. Definitely, whoever they tie together will become the third party, and that third party is going to cause confusion in that home. The expectation of God is that both the father and the mother will have released their children. The father of the boy and the mother of the boy will have released their son. The father of the girl and the mother of the girl, they will have released their daughter. They will allow them to go. I know parents many times, especially mothers, 
They want to see what is happening to their daughter. Is your husband uh, watchful? Is he careful? Does he eat your food? Did you cook well? What is my friend? That is no longer your business. When you begin to ask those questions, you are bringing some certain things in that were never there before. And when you dig that hole, you will, meet, you will hit a particular rock which is going to blast and scatter that marriage. So, we discover that now, the Bible said the two of them are together. They become husband and wife, Adam and Eve, and they were living together. In chapter 3 of the book of uh, Genesis, you will see that after the two of them were naked, after the two of them loved one another, when the two of them were already stayed together, then the enemy came. And that enemy is referred to as a serpent. I'm reading it to you for you to get the message. When Jesus said, in the beginning it was not so. And now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, and God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. This was when the third party stepped into this program. What am I talking about? The two of them were naked. They were there. But the serpent knew that if he called through the man, he will not succeed. The man is wiser. He will knock him out. He knew that if the man and the woman were together, he will not succeed. And so he decided to come when the woman was alone. Knowing fully well that the woman was not as matured as the man. And so he decided to add sand to their food. And when he asked that question, the woman now began to talk. You know many times women, they may speak more than expected. And when you speak extra, instead of saying the exact thing, definitely you run into trouble. Instead of the woman just to say, yes, God said we shouldn't uh, eat and stop there. And we won't talk more. No. You know what? He went an extra mile and begin to tell the uh, serpent that we should not even touch it. That is why he brought in the problem. And do you know that the third party that came in, he may be the mother-in-law. He may be the mother of the husband or the mother of the wife. And when they came in to ask some certain question, and you are careless, to release information that are not made for them, then eventually you are paved way for problem and crisis in the home. And this woman, talking like that, then the devil took advantage of their argument. In verse 2, and the woman said unto the husband, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the tree of the tree uh, uh, in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it. Finer. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That is addition to the word of God. Have it be, you just say, there is a tree that God said we shouldn't eat. That will put a stop to it. And the serpent will say, which one? He will now say, well, I cannot tell. Let my husband come. Who knows very well, he will, tell, he will show it to you. The woman did not do that. And so, the serpent in verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. God said you will die. Satan said you will not die. Who is a liar? And that is why the Bible says the devil is a liar from the beginning. When you believe what Satan said more than what God says, then you implicate yourself and put yourself into trouble. God said if you do it, you will die. Satan said if you do it, you will not die. Take for example, adultery and fornication. Scattered any home. Destroyed any family. Put uh, sour the love that was in the home. Causes bitterness to spring up in the family and causes hatred between husband and wife. Not only that, it will even cause death because you may carry a disease that becomes incurable. And once you share your love between two men, you allow one man to sleep with you who is not your husband, and definitely you will have interest in that man. You begin to defend that man. You begin to support that man. And you now have a divided attention. Definitely, when you have two things you are interested in, you will eventually settle for one. And once that happens, a division will come into your mind, a confusion will come into your mind, a pollution will come into your mind, and you will discover that the love and the interest you have for your husband before, you become divided. And so, Satan said, you will not die. God said, you will die. 
People that are going to marijuana, they smoke in their hand. The scripture make it plain, plain. This thing is not made for human consumption. But the devil tell you that it makes you wise. And so may go for it. God expects you to live with your only one wife and only your husband. And the devil tell you that if you remain with only one, you will not know the difference of different kinds of sex posture. You will not know the enjoyment you will derive from a fat one. And you will not know the enjoyment you derive from a, a slim one. And they begin to tell you that unless you have two or three or you have many, multiple of them, you will not know the enjoyment you will pick from various ones. And the moment you decide to test another woman, definitely she will not be like that of your wife. It will, some people begin to tell you, this one is better than my wife. When God said, when you go into this, you will scatter your home. You will destroy your life. You will destroy your marriage. You will destroy the love you have between you and your spouse. And the devil will tell you, no, it only makes you wiser. It may only makes you to be more enjoyful, enjoyable. And then you, you, you subscribe to the voice of the devil. You enter into trouble. In verse 5, for God does know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. Satan preached another gospel. Separate from that of God, Satan preached another gospel, another gospel of pollution, another gospel of destruction, another gospel which we implicate now for life, another gospel that will bring sorrow, another gospel that will bring sickness, another gospel that will bring uh, death, another gospel that will bring suffering, another gospel that will implicate man and drive him out of the glory of God and pull him into a place of corruption and make his life a useless one. For example, look at the drunkards, those who take alcohol. The Bible has made us to understand that those people that are, uh, that are into alcohol, they are not wise. And the devil will tell you that it is when you drink that alcohol that you become wise. When you decide to obey Satan and not God, uh, the eventual result is going to implicate you and add more sorrow to your sorrow. Alright? In verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. Now, what God has said not to do, the woman has done that. What happened immediately? The moment that woman ate that fruit, he took on the nature of sin. The moment that woman ate that fruit, he took on the nature of corruption. He became incompatible together with the, wife, with the husband. But, not until the woman gave to the husband. <clears throat> and she now said, this is the fruit. And he gave it to the husband. The Bible said the husband took and ate. It was only then that their eyes both were open. If it was only the woman that ate that thing, and the man did not eat, the eyes of the man will not be open. Probably the eyes of the woman may not be open. Because the woman is made perfected until he was united together with the husband. Now, where am I going? Adam and Eve that were married together by God. That God has given warning on what to do and what not to do. Now, they have gone outside the will of God. They have eaten the fruit commanded to them by God not to taste. They have done what God said they should not do. Evil has not begun to pursue them. And do you know what happened? What that woman brought, what that woman did, implicated the husband. How do I know? Come down. In verse 9. In verse 9. Okay, let me take it from verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Do you know? Look at that. Take what will make a wife to hide away from the husband. It is only one sin coming. What will make a, a man to hide away from another man? It is only one sin coming. When sin coming, fear follow. And when fear is there, then what tell every other atrocities will follow. They heard the voice of their beloved father. 
the God of heaven, the one who provided them with everything they needed. Do you know when they had the voice of that God, instead of them joyfully appreciating God going to meet him, they were hiding. And not only that, they get themselves leaves to cover their nakedness. How long will leaves remain before it dries? How long will the protection of the leaves, the leaves that when you plug it in the morning before evening, it wither? Now they take that same thing to cover their nakedness. The original glory, the glory of God, the power of God, the spirit of God that cover them and make them over and make them uh, terror to every animal that makes them to become the leader. At that time, snakes did nothing evil to them. At that time, lions did nothing evil to them. They were playing together. They we we even lie down together and talk together, discuss together. But now that sin came in, a great wall of demarcation came. And so when they had God walking in the garden, what do they do? They went to hide themselves. And the master and the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Unto him, where are thou? Now take this question very simple. Some people said, why was God asking them where were they? Does it mean that they were so high hidden that even God did not see them? No, God saw them. He saw them. He only wanted them to speak. He wanted to hear from them. And so, Adam, in verse 10, look at it. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. He never saw himself naked before. He never knew that all through his life he has always been naked. He was now reporting himself to God that he was naked. That was the sincerity. And, and he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I command thee that thou should not eat? And he was twelve. And he said, The woman. Can you see it? Instead of him to say, yes, sir, I've eaten that food. Probably God will have given them a remedy. He started to give excuse. There is one thing I know of all human beings all over the world. Nobody teaches you how to make excuse. You know how to make excuse as a result of the fallen nature. The sin that resides inside man, the fallen nature, the corruption that is hidden in our heart, taught us different kinds of excuses in case it comes this way this is what you should do in case it has a, you know when you are asking questions the, nobody prepared them this is how you will give this lie they already have it the man said the woman that thou givest me eh, gave me the fruit and I did it and the Lord said unto the woman what is this that thou hast done and the woman said the serpent the serpent and when i look at that and i saw what was happening god now pronounced judgment upon them he puts judgment upon the serpent first in verse 14 and he puts judgment upon the woman in chapter in verse 15 and in verse 17 and god also put a judgment upon adam and then when you look at that in verse 22 and the lord god said Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, least he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. In verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. In verse 24, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubim and flaming sword, we turn every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Alright. In chapter 4, I'm reading verse 1. And Adam knew his wife. Stop there. Eve has allowed the third party to come into the house. And the third party has caused them a terrible error which they are going to carry for eternity. Eve has eaten the fruit 
that God has commanded them not to touch, not to eat. Eve has brought in sorrow. He has brought in sickness. He has brought in suffering. He has brought in pain. He has brought in tears. He has brought in death. And he has brought in eternal separation from God. God drove them out. What happened? What happened? When God drove them out, what happened? Instead of Adam now to say, What? Well, you are the one who caused this confusion. You are the one who bring this suffering to me. Because of what you have done, we are not going to live together again. Go your way, I will go my way. That's where I'm going. Adam has every reason to divorce Eve. Adam has every reason to send Eve away. Adam has every reason to tell to tender, even in any court, that this is why I am no longer going to marry Eve. But you know, Instead of Adam to do away with A, Eve, instead of Adam to say I suck Eve, instead of Adam to say we shall never meet again, instead of Adam to say you are not going to be my wife anymore, instead of Adam to divorce Eve, he knew him, knew her. They came together. My brother, what am I saying? I'm telling you with this that God hates divorce. God hate divorce. As I show you from the Bible, Adam has every reason to tell Eve that you are not going to be my wife anymore. I don't need you anymore. You must not follow me anymore. I think I show you, even from the Old Testament, what God said about divorce. Come to Malachi. I'm reading Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I want us to begin to read from verse 14. Yet, you say we are off because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she the, thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. My brother, pastor, prophet, evangelist, minister of God, can I tell you that was the same woman that you started together. That was the same woman that you were praying together. That was the same woman you said God has chosen her for you as at the time you were getting married to her. You remember that we Christians, children of God, we don't marry until we hear from God. We don't lay hands upon a man or upon a woman until we hear from God. We have concluded that God has ordered me to marry this woman or to marry this man. That is when we agree together and get married. Hear me. There is no how the two of you will have the same character. It's not possible. If God gives you a wife that the two of you have the same character, glory be to God. But when it is not so, and the woman has a different character, and the man has a different character because you are born by different parents, sometimes we marry into a cross-cultural marriage. When you, a white man, maybe from America, get married to a black woman, maybe from Ghana or from Nigeria, and the two of you are not from the same place, friend, listen to me. Your character, your behavior, your temperament definitely will be different from one another. When you decide that this is what I'm going to do. Many times, the other person will see something wrong in what you have in mind to do. And he want to correct you. Because two are better than one. But that time you said no. There are many things that are wrong. When we're about to get married, we have four temperaments. We have the sanguine, the choleric, the phlegmatic, and all that. Every one of these temperaments has... Uh, uh, the way of their behavior. Take for example, a sanguine. A sanguine is different from a choleric. They are different together. One has the character of quick action. The other one has the character of slow action. When the man is of a quick action and the woman is that individual that will sit down 
He has to look at it uh, critically, look at it objectively, look at it inside out. And the man is the type of man who say, let's do it now, go and do it. And the woman is looking at it. If we do it this way, we we'll make a mistake. Then the man will come and begin and become angry. I've given you an order. You fail to carry out my order, my brother. We are different. We must learn to lean together. Because if the, this one has autocratic character and this one has a, a character that has slow in action, then definitely we will begin to fight one another. And that is why we must learn. That is why we ministers must be good example. If Eve was managed by Adam, despite what she did, my brother, for us to come out and tell the world that as at the time I got married to this woman, I didn't play well. It is now I discover that Satan sent this woman to come and destroy my ministry. My brother, listen to me. That excuse is not acceptable. It's not acceptable. There is no one on earth who is not born again that is not prone to be used by Satan. Many times, at the time we are thinking of marriage, our eyes are clouded by the lust or the position of that person. Maybe you as a man, you are you that are thinking of getting married. You have a master degree. That woman has master degree. Maybe you are a lecturer in university. She is a lecturer. We already know that she's having fat salary. You are having fat salary. Maybe she's working in uh, as a civil servant on one grade, a higher grade, and you two you are on higher grade, and you feel that well, we'll be bringing our money together. We we'll never have financial crisis. That was what you were looking at. Maybe as at the time you were married, that this lady, you never knew you are going to be in the ministry, and probably this woman has assets. He could travel overseas and return. He was always going and coming. And you felt that, well, if I'm married to this woman, myself and herself, we will always go overseas. And that is what, what befriended your eyes. Maybe the man was in overseas and uh, he used to come home and go. And you feel, once I get married to this man, we we'll go together. And all that were what you were saying. You are looking at the car he was riding. You are looking at the house he was living. You are looking at the benefits and the thing that surrounded him. His father is the governor. His mother is the minister of education. Uh, then the father is the president. Or the father happens to be a chief. Or the mother is the managing, executive managing director of group of company. All those were what you were watching. And now you have got back to the person. And those things that you are seeing there are no longer enough to hold the love together. And you are now telling me it is Satan that brought it. Adam and Eve, they were together. As at the time they Eve sold uh, Adam or sold their marriage to corruption, Adam did not come out and said, Because of what you have done, we will never again marry together and drive that woman away. No, they were coping, they were both suffering together. They were both living together. I have seen many people, especially ministers, that tells me that woman is a witch. The Bible says there is no connection between light and darkness. Oh, that woman has gone into adultery. She has committed fornication. She has committed adultery. She is having another man listen to me. I know you read the Bible. You must have seen Hosea. And God was the one telling Hosea, go and bring that woman back. The woman would have gone, commit adultery all along. God will say, go and bring him back. One of our founding fathers in this our church, at that time, was always on the road. And one day, she returned to the house. And as she came, as that Baba entered the house, there was uh, a man together with the wife inside their bedroom. The Baba just enter. Will he, does he need to knock his own door before he open? Baba opened the parlor and just went straight inside the bedroom, wanted to remove his suit. As he got there, he met mommy and another man on the bed. And the moment they saw Baba, they jumped up. Baba just closed the door, came out and sat in the parlor. 
expecting them to finish whatever they are doing. And the man was afraid. To come out from the room, he didn't know what was going to happen to him. All he did was just to put on his trouser. He, he, he could not wear his shirt. He bought the shoe. He carried them on his hand. And he opened the door, wanted to sneak out of the of the of their house. Papa just told him, said, take it easy, Mr. Man. Wear your cloth, wear your shoe. The man was silvery. Baba said, don't, don't worry, don't worry. Just wear your thing and you can. And then he opened the door again, asked the woman. The wife was weeping on the bed. And Baba said, please, I want to eat. Can you please stand up and help me to get something to eat? I'm coming from a far journey. The woman was weeping. As if Baba did not see anything, my friend listened to me. Many of our heroes that have gone, there are many things they pass through. And today we agree. No, 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 no. I cannot do that. I cannot accept that. I'm not praying that your wife should be wayward. I'm not praying that your husband should be wayward. But let me tell you, for those people who succeeded, and you are looking at the top, there is none of them that has no scar. And that is why when we come out and tell the church, you remember? The other pastor there over there, one of the big pastors we have in this country, you know it was on Sunday after service, he announced to the church, he was to say the grave right at the microphone. He was telling the church himself and the wife are no longer married. It wasn't the first time, it wasn't the second time, that he did that inside the church. I'm afraid. What do these type of people preach? What are we teaching our members? Friends, if in this world alone we have our hope, we have all people, the most miserable people. Let me tell you today that we have, we have a goal. What are going to be the scar you will show when you get to heaven? When you have nothing to endure for Christ. And you are saying, Pastor so as well have divorced your wife. And they are still, and the ministry will bring me listening to me. It is not easy for a man to divorce and still keep his ministry. You will say, oh, No, I know that man, the ministry is still big. My brother, find out is that ministry being held together by the Holy Ghost? Is it the power of God that is working in that ministry? Or do you think? Something somewhere is wrong. Are you talking to me about these prophets that will tell you the name of your great grand grand grandmother who died more than 40 years ago? Are you telling me of these prophets that will tell you the food you ate last night before you sleep? Is that what you are telling? Is that the work of the Holy Ghost? Is that what the Holy Ghost is asking us to go and do? And you are talking, you are telling me of the man who is telling you that there is a mango tree in the back of your house in the village. Is that the vision that God wants us to see? And you are saying, Yes, these people listen to me. Those people can do anything, they could divorce and remarry at, at will because they know where they are, they got their power, they know where they, what they are working with. But for the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit residing in you. As a minister of the gospel, the moment you divorce, you know you lose your ministry. You don't divorce and keep your ministry. To keep that ministry, you must go and look for something else to keep it. And that is why, no matter whatever is happening, you are telling me that man is wicked, that woman is wicked. I'm not praying that you should marry a man who, who pull out a gun and said, I will kill you if you don't go out of my house. I never pray you should marry that. I don't pray that you should marry a man who will bring out a knife and said, tonight I'm going to kill you if you enter this place. I'm not praying that you should get to that. But I believe very strongly, as ministers of the gospel, as children of God, especially pastors, we must be very, very careful. Pastors, lady evangelists, and prophetess, we must be very careful. The devil is out recruiting people that will carry along together with him to hell. And that is why we, as children of God, as ministers of the gospel, we must keep encouraging our people, no matter whatever they are passing through, no matter the fight, no matter the battle, 
no matter the waywardness, we must keep praying and allow God to lead us. It is only when you are under the leadership of God, when you are under the directive of the Holy Spirit. Uh -uh. I, I know if I should begin to tell you of oh, sorry. Many, many years ago, I was in Lagos. There was a man who the wife decided to fight. And the man went out. As soon as the man returned, you know, this woman came up and then he gripped the cloth of the man. And the man did not talk. He heated the man once, he heated him the second time. The man was just say, What have I done? He expected the man to beat her back. The man did not. He heated the man, the man did not. Then he went to the radio that they had. He carried the radio, broke it, and the team pieces. You know what the man said? He said, The two of us will not hear news anymore. We cannot play any cassette anymore. And as if he put fuel on it, the woman carried a fan and break, knocked the fan on the, on the ground, and the team break. The man said, Well, the both of us shall sleep in the heat. When you saw that everything he does does not move the man, he ran out. The man was riding a motorcycle. And he, you know, the woman got there. He wanted to push the motorcycle so that the thing will fall and scatter. Then the thing fell on the woman. And it was the side of the exhaust, exhaust or the silencer that fell upon her leg. And that thing burned that woman. And the woman cried. And the man just opened the window and begged the people and said, Please help me separate my wife and the motorcycle. They are fighting. And then, as at the time they removed that motorcycle away from that woman's body, you know what happened? A great saw was already on her leg. The man took the woman to the hospital and they were treating her. How many of us we have such patients? Look at how God defended the man. Look at the scar the woman put on her own body as a result of her impatient. Wanting to have a way, wanting to fight when the man was not ready to fight. I'm not praying that that should be our Lord. But I'm asking you, you need patience, especially as a pastor, when the devil is trying to come in through your wife. You should know that this is a spiritual warfare. You should know that this is a battle that I must fight. You should know when the devil comes with big noise, when you are silent, it is difficult for someone to be beating a man who did not talk. It is difficult for someone to be fighting and be bullying on, on an individual who remains silent. It takes two to fight. It takes two people to fight each other. If you decide to allow God to fight for you, you will, you will go home smiling. And if you decide that I will not agree, I will take loss into my hand, I will do it on my own way, my brother, the end of it will be bitter. And that is why we must be very, very careful to know that whatever we are, we are privileged, we are an opportunity, it is God that has helped us. When God said, in that verse 15, and did not he make one, yet he, the residue, let me read it again from verse 14 for you to understand, yet he said, wherefore, because the Lord had been witness between thee and the wife of your youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant and did not he make one spirit and whereof wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed therefore take heed to your spirit and let not dead treacherously against the wife of his youth in verse 16 for the Lord the God of Israel said that he hated putting away for what covered violence with his garment says the Lord of hosts therefore take heed to your spirit that he did not treacherously God has warned even in the Old Testament before Christ came God has warned that divorce is not part of his program God warned. Let me read from verse um, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading verse 31. 
It has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Verse 32, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall, come, uh, shall marry her that is divorced, committed adultery. That was Jesus talking to us. I know you say, oh, Jesus said, once it is adultery, we can go ahead. But he made us to understand that we can always forgive. I'm not praying that your spouse should fall into adultery or into fornication. But when you decide, because of this, I am not going to marry anymore. Number one, you have refused to forgive. And the Bible makes it so plain. In chapter 6 of this same Matthew. Chapter 6 of this same Matthew. When Jesus began to teach his disciples about the Lord's Prayer. In verse 12, he said, And forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. What is the meaning of that? Forgive us our offenses as we forgive those who also offended us. In verse 14, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, their offenses, their bad things they have done unto you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. In verse 15, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, their offenses, and their sin against you, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, if you decide to go into divorce, you have agreed that I'm not going to forgive this woman or this man for what he has done. For the fact that to determine you are not going to forgive, verse 15 is telling you that your heavenly father also will not forgive you. In Mark, you know when Jesus began to talk in Mark chapter 11, he says something similar to what I've just read unto you now. In Mark chapter 11, when you read them, verse 25, and when you start praying, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. In verse 26, but if you do not forgive those who have offended you, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Now, when you decide that I must divorce, she must go. You have discovered an error, a sin, that you have made up your mind you will not forgive. And he said, when you pray, and every one of us want to pray. Every one of us go to the prayer mountain. Every one of us go to night vigil. Every one of us go on our knees. Every one of us talk to God in heaven. And if you want God to forgive you, the Bible says you must equally forgive the one who has offended you. you. I know you are so many things against this person, against that brother, against that sister. God is saying, if you want him to forgive you, if you want to maintain your name in the book of life, if you want to remain among the people to be raptured, if you want to remain need to go with the Lord on the last day, he said, forgive. It is only when you forgive that heaven also will forgive you. But if you fail to forgive those who offend you, neither will God in heaven forgive your trespasses. Bow your head anywhere we are and let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for the grace you have received. I want to thank you for helping us to know you better. Accept our thanks in the name of Jesus. I'm asking, oh God, that as many as are repenting of their sin and they are asking for your mercy, Father, forgive them in the name of Jesus. Thank you because I know you answer. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.